welcome to our show, Meaning and Motivation, where we explore the many ways we make meaning together and our motivation. Why do we do what we do? I'm your host, Tim Thompson. With us tonight is Ben Hahn. And Ben is a two-time uh, All-American in cross-country and track. And you're also a health and phys ed major at Edinburgh University and a geography minor. Yeah, that's right. Welcome, Ben. Yeah, well, Tim, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, there's a few things we want to check into tonight and okay. find out about. One is just talk to you about running in general and uh, why run and yeah. what's it do for you. And then we want to talk to you about a project that you've been working on as well, and we'll get to that. Sure. But first of all, how, how long have you been running? and what? I've been running for a long time. Uh, I know I'm probably one of the younger guests that have probably been on the show, but uh, don't let that deter you. I've been running since I was seven years old. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm 23 now. I've been running for a while. Um, actually, how I got into running was an interesting story in itself. Um, my family worked a, uh, or volunteered for a local 5K race. Mm -hmm. So our church put on a 5K race, and when I was six, I told my dad, you know, I'm going to run that someday. And he said, well, you need to train. And training to a six-year-old was a little different than what training is today. <laughs> right. And uh, so I... Uh, Throughout the next year, I did some training as I ran from my house to the playground and uh, played around for a little bit and then came back to the how, house. How far was that, going to the playground? About a half a mile. Yeah. So That's far, though, for a six- or seven-year-old? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the next year came around, the same race. And so instead of handing out water with my family, I actually towed the line. And I ran the whole 5K as a seven-year-old in 27 minutes. Yeah. And at that someone came up to my dad and you know, t kind of tapped him on his shoulder and said, yeah, that's not normal. You got a natural there. Yeah. yeah. So from then on, I just, you know, I was realized that I did have something different, you know, right. and I was able to run um, longer and farther for whatever reason. And you've done pretty well in your career. Like what kinds of accomplishments have you had in running? Well, I've had, uh, I've been fortunate. You know, I was uh, a Pennsylvania state champ in 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, I won the 3,200 meter run, um, or as most of us just call it, the two mile, mm -hmm. although it's technically a little shorter than two the two mile. Mm -hmm. um, I was several time uh, all state place winner in cross country and uh, so I did well in high school and then in college at Edinburgh I was a two time all American as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, one in cross country and one in track. What's that mean to be all American? I mean people hear that all the time. What, what's, right. what's that mean? Well it used to be uh, strictly the top 25 um, college athletes you know when whatever division it is. Now when I say all American I'm referring to Division II All-American, mm -hmm. which is what Edinburgh University Cross Country and Track is. Mm -hmm. um, Division I also has their All-American standards as well. Um, so top 25, typically. And uh, I was 17th in cross country, so I received the All-American award. Right. And then in track, um, it goes to the top eight places, gets All-American. Right. And I was seventh in the 5K, so right. I was able to receive my second. And to do something like that, to be All-American in track and cross-country, to run distance, there's got to be a different kind of mindset that goes with that, right? To, to a crazy get mindset. into some, <laughs> I guess yeah, so. Yeah. What kind of mindset does it yeah. take? What do you? Well, I wish I could tell you exactly what it is. I think I just I stumbled upon this. Um, as I mentioned, I, was, I excelled at a young age, and at that age, I feel like, you know, seven years old and through high school. We're still trying to figure out what we're doing, you know, what we're good at, who we are. So a lot of those questions that were, you know, I was struggling with as most people in grade school or high school do the same. And I was good at it and I knew that and that felt good. And so, you know, at the very end of the day, um, I felt a sense of worth, I guess, because I was, I was able to excel at something. Um, and I think initially that's what, what drove me. Um, so to get out the door was simply, you know, I want to be good. I want to have a, I want to count. I want to do something different, I guess. Right. Yeah. And you got to have, I mean, I think you got to have the physical makeup to start with because, you know, in order to excel, there's got to be some natural ability that goes with it. And then there's that mindset. Like you said, you find out that you can do it and you appreciate mm -hmm. it. But there's something in distance running with certain other grueling sports. There has to be something else, too, that keeps you at it. I mean, isn't it so easy to quit or to, oh, say, yeah. to say slow down? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And that's, that's interesting that, you know, in the theme of the show, uh, meaning and motivation, mm -hmm. um, 
A lot of times you question as a runner, you know, why am I doing this? What is the meaning of this? Um, we always joke, we as fellow runners, we always say, you know, when running's going well and you're racing fast, that everything's okay. Yeah. But it's when you're sick or you're injured or you're hurt, you're on the sideline, it's when you really start questioning, you know, what are you doing this for? And I think that goes with every sport. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what was it for me initially was just to be good at something, to excel at something. But throughout college, through sicknesses and injuries and different challenges that came up, it made me really question what I was doing it for. And I think the biggest thing for running is you get a real, true experience. And what I mean by that is if I go out and start running a 10-mile or 15-mile run, there's very few stimuluses in, in our civilized world that give you that type of stimulus and that type of is uh, that the, feedback. Is that the runner's high? Yeah, that they the runner's talk about? high. That's okay. exactly right. What, what is the runner's high? Yeah. What happens? What? Well, as a health major here at Edinburgh, you know, those, uh, my professors will say, you know, you produce endorphins when you run, and that makes you happy. That's the runner's high. Mm -hmm. and, and scientifically, I, I think that's correct. You know, as far as I'm concerned, or any other runner go, that I've talked to, is you get out there on a run, and you know, somewhere around an hour, hour and a half into your run, um, you just have this feeling, light feeling, I guess. And then after a hard, hard workout, you can sometimes almost feel like you're floating. Mm -hmm. And that's just hard to get um, in your typical day to day. That but, sounds like something that people shoot for in meditation or something, yeah. some kind of a transcendental yeah. type of experience. That's interesting you brought that up because there's actually runners today that are experimenting with meditation and yoga and some type of Eastern uh, religious philosophy mm -hmm. and tying it into running. Mm -hmm. And they're finding success. They're, they're, they're running at a higher level. They're not getting injured as much. And so there's still research to be done on that, but it, absolutely. Do you know anything about that? I mean, do you know, like, when they talk about uh, when a runner or any athlete is in the zone, what, what does that mean? What, what's the zone? In the zone, yeah. Well, I wish we could bottle the zone up and mm -hmm. you just drink it and you'd be all set. I think a lot of you know, coaches and authors and so forth try to say, you know, here's the secret to mm -hmm. the zone. Well, that's true. And, and I think that with running especially, there's not another 10 guys out on the field. There's not another four other people that help you do what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're an individualized sports for that matter. It's you. You know, another sport comes to mind is wrestling, which I also wrestled in high school. So I was able to do, do that as well. But when it's just you, um, and you have to f put yourself in a mental state where you're going to accomplish the goal that's at task. So if it's running, I'm, I want to finish this distance. Or if it's racing, it's not just finishing anymore. There's another Annie. Now you know that you can finish the distance because you've trained hard. Mm -hmm. So you know you can do that. But now it's I want to run a certain time. Mm -hmm. And that's where it really becomes challenging because time is what runners judge everything on. They say, hey man, what's your mile time? You know, what's your 5K time? What's this time? And it's so concrete. And that's what is very scary as a runner is you get to measure yourself every time you go out when you race. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't mean to poke fun at any other team sports because they have advantages themselves. Um, but for example, if, you, if, a, if a football team goes plays another football team and, they, and, and one team wins and they have a huge game, they say, wow, we really, we really did great. Well, and they did. In that game, we can look at the score, we can look at the stats, we can talk about the game afterwards and say, you know, they really did well. How do they stand up in their conference? We're not sure. How do they stand up in the nation? Questionable. How do they stand up against all teams of all time forever? Mm -hmm. It's really hard to make those discussions. But with running, you know in it. time, uh -huh. we have records from the 40s, the 30s, the 20s. Right. Anybody that's run a 400-meter track, and someone had a stopwatch, we can compare it. So if you're going, you know, going for time, mm -hmm. and you're going to get into that zone that kicks in whenever it does after an hour or however far you go, is there something, uh, is, it, is it really kind of a letting go? Are you letting go of something in mind that, like when I, when I run, it's painful. <laughs> and, it's, and I'm breathing, especially if I try to race, which isn't very fast. Right. But I'm breathing very hard, and I'm struggling, and I can feel pain, and I swear my hips are drying out, and all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, 
I, I feel like I need to let go of those thoughts. Is there something well, I think to that? Yeah, there is. There is. That's, that's a great point. Um, I always do say this for people that are, um, oh, I'd say, weekend warriors or joggers. They run a little bit here and there for fitness. Um, that pain that you feel, we still feel that same pain. As, and when I say we as competitive runners, it's just in different doses. You know, mm -hmm. With training, your body gets hardened, your muscles change, your respiratory system, your whole cardiovascular system becomes you know, at a higher level. And so you get to a point where you can go out and run for a few miles without any of those aches and pains and uh, breathing problems and um, you know, challenges that you deal with mm -hmm. just getting out the door. Um, so you know, to get in the zone, I think it ties back when that somewhere along the way, even in a conditioned athlete, pain sets in, fatigue sets in. We can't run, I can't sprint forever, right? Mm -hmm. So that same pain hits me maybe just a little later than it does you. Right. You know, someone else might go out the door and man, the first few steps hurt, you know? For me, it might not be the first few steps, but somewhere along the line. So near the end of a marathon, yeah, you exactly. might be laboring and you're breathing sure. and feeling some pain. Or even in a mile race, if I'm running full tilt, as hard as I can, you feel that pain. Yeah. And, and back to the zone, absolutely, you have to block that out. And you have to say, I know this is going to hurt. And it's going to hurt for several more minutes, probably. Mm -hmm. um, but I can do this. And what we found is that pain is a good thing. If you, have, uh, you hurt your knee, for example, you know, that's your body letting you know that there's something going on. You should probably take a break and relax. Mm -hmm. It's your bo it's body's uh, way of protecting yourself. Right. But what we find is that those pain thresholds um, almost come in a little prematurely when you're running that you actually have this little window afterwards. So like pain kicks in and I hurt and I want to say, I'm going to stop. But if I push for just a little longer, I realize that I, st I can run for a little longer. And I can go a few laps or you know, maybe an extra mile or something like that. And I think that, that builds confidence in everything that you do. Right. You know, it's like, yeah, this is hard, school's hard, or my job is really hard, it's challenging, I, I don't know if I can handle this. Well, push in a little longer, and you may may find some of those benefits. Right. Do you find that running is meditative for you? Is it something? It, what are you thinking about when you're out for a run? Well, I think about uh, anything and everything under the sun. You know, I mm -hmm. think I compare it to someone that's just driving. You know, they've got a long, a long eight-hour trip or something, and just thoughts are coming through. And um, I find that I can think clearer when I'm running. Thoughts I can hone in on a little more specifically. Um, when I'm not running, or let's say I take some time off, I have a lot of extra energy, right. and I don't. Sometimes I don't know what to do with it. So running for me uh, definitely is meditative, and it helps me clear my thoughts out for sure. Right. Yeah. Good. Now you've got, besides uh, graduating this year from Edinburgh after a long, uh, lustrous career, you're heading on to start up something called the Mancus Project That's in Colorado. Right. Tell us about that. What is the Mancus Project? Well, the Mancus Project is, is something that uh, between school and between my competitive running here at Edinburgh, it fills up pretty much all my time. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that has developed in the last few months. I would say probably last November is when I really started formulating um, the ideas on the Mancus Project. But when I think about it, you know, it actually started two years before that. And it started at Edinburgh University. And uh, that's why it's fitting that we're able to have this talk here, is because it really happened here on this campus for me. Um, as a health and physical education student, um, or any student here, for that matter, at Edinburgh, you have to take a variety of classes, your core classes, uh, to get a, a well-rounded education. And I took classes such as environmental issues, societal issues, um, as well as a few others. And in each of those classes, you know, I began to put together a picture that the world is there's a lot of problems out there. There's things that need to be addressed. Um, and that humans um, are adding to those problems. Or sometimes we can find that they're directly causing those problems. And so, you know, knowing that and, and kind of, you know, getting that information, uh, initially I was like, well, we need to do something, you know? And I think any young person with some drive says, well, we need to do something. But then else I learned about how the government works and how our certain rules and regulations and our structure that we have in our society works. Mm -hmm. And I realized that it's challenging to actually get things done 
mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, especially when you want to change the status quo of things that have been happening for generations and generations. So the Mancus Project is a running club that values sustainability. Now, how did I get there? Well, my idea was at Edinburgh, how am I going to address all these problems? I can write a letter, you know, I might be able to write a letter to a state representative or go down to Washington and voice my concerns. But that's been done and uh, there's not a lot of change. You know, I might be able to get my friends together and we could all sign a petition of some sort and we could start to do change that way. And that would be better. But I felt like I needed to do something more. I felt like I needed to do something at a higher level. Mm -hmm. And, you know, coming from my background, rural Pennsylvania, I'm from the lower class, um, I wasn't going to be handed any, uh, anything on a silver platter. You know, running was what got me to go to college. And so I said, well, maybe running can help me address some of these problems. And so I started coming up with this idea of a group of runners living together, training together, and working for the common good, um, while at the same time raising awareness on all these problems. Mm -hmm. If I'm a runner and I know runners, <laughs> runners know other runners. And runners are businessmen, and runners are lawyers, and runners are every walks of life. Mm -hmm. And so that was the thread that I thought I could transcend my class barrier with running. It got me to college, it got me an education, it got me to see the world. Um, thus far, why can't it take me to the next step? Right. And so I started thinking of that, and, I, and the next question was, okay, this is an idea. You're going to start this group. You're going, to, you're going to start a group somewhere, okay? Well, to start something like this, you need to have some property. You need to have actual people that want to join you. You need to have uh, some resources. And so I thought in my mind that this is a project that I was going to start maybe five, ten years down the road. You know, when I got a job and when I had the actual resources to be able to do, what, do this. Well, so I kind of put it on the back burner for a little while. It was still on my, it's still on my mind. I told my friends about it, but it was something that I was going to do in the future. Well, flash forward to uh, my junior year, last year. Uh, I was feeling a little stressed out. Um, I needed a break. Um, just needed a break. I needed to go find myself, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. So I actually took a semester off from school, and I moved to Montana. Montana. <laughs> Why Montana? Why not? I'd never been to Montana before. Um, it was a big state. Uh, why not? So I applied to this ranch in Montana as a fly fishing guide. And I got the job. So now I'm hired. I have a place to stay. It's near Missoula, Montana for anyone that's uh, uh, been out that way. It's beautiful. Uh -huh. um, so I got a job out there and here I was in a completely new place and an area where no one knew me as a runner and I was just finding myself again, I guess you could say, on the, on the trout streams of Montana. And I met a girl in Montana. Uh, she is a young lady from the University of Redlands. She had just graduated, which is in Southern California. Um, so she also was working at the ranch with her environmental science background and we kind of hit it off. And uh, we started talking, we'd go for hikes in the woods, you know, we just have great after long afternoons. And more and more of this project of mine started coming off again. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking about this running club. I'm thinking about this environmental awareness project. And she encouraged it. She said, you know, this is great. You should really think about it some more. And so that job was during the summer. Um, the, excuse me, Montana was in the summer. And I had also taken the fall semester off. And so I moved to Flagstaff, Arizona to do some training, which is, uh, Flagstaff is known as a uh, kind of a running mecca. It's at high elevation, there's a lot of elite runners there. And so this girl I met in Montana, I said, you know, would, would you want to come to Flagstaff with me? Would you want to take the next step? And she said, sure. And, um, so we moved to Flagstaff and I just got on Craigslist. And I was looking for a place just to s stay for a couple months and do some training with my girlfriend. That's, she's not my girlfriend. Her name's Dylan. Mm -hmm. um, and I followed this uh, ad on Craigslist. It said, uh, um, three acres, $800 a month. I said, sure, let's, let's check it out. 
And I call the guy up, real nice guy. His name is Barry. Um, and uh, he says, yeah, we got a place, come check it out. So we check it out. And long story short, we get to be friends with, the, with this landlord, uh, Barry. And we live on his land and um, we just have a great time. And we actually have dinners together and we spend a lot of time together. And uh, we get in these conversations about what I think about, um, you know, environmentalism and sustainability and running and everything. So naturally the project kind of comes up again, it's dinner talk. And Barry says, you know, that I really like the idea about this. This is, this is kind of neat. He says, you should check out my property, my other property. I said, where's your other property at? He says, it's in Colorado. I go, man, Colorado. He's like, I'd love to check that out sometime. Mm -hmm. He goes, yeah, it's in the, it's this little town called Mancus. And I'm thinking, Mancus, who's ever heard of that, you know? So he says, you check it out. Take Dylan up there, go take a look. So Dylan and I actually get in the truck and we drive up to Mancus, which is about five hours away from Flagstaff. And uh, we check out his property. It's 24 acres. It's got a pond. There's beautiful mountains in the background. There's trails, dirt trails all over the place. And it was just, it kind of felt like a dream. It was oh, like all of a sudden. Sounds like a dream. Sounds beautiful. Yeah. Now that's, that's up in uh, southwest South, Colorado? Yeah, southwest Is that Colorado. near Mesa Verde or? Yes, exactly. Okay. It's uh, Mesa Verde National Park is uh, just outside of Mancus. Okay. And another kind of point of reference is uh, the town of Durango is very nearby. Okay. Um, so yeah, Dylan and I went up to, to Mancus in that Mesa Verde kind of four corners uh, area and checked it out. Loved the property and uh, went back to Flagstaff, talked to Barry. Long story short, he was on board. All of a sudden I had a property. And I thought, I don't know if I'm ever going to get this opportunity again. Yeah. Maybe, but. So what is the, the idea behind it is that it's a group of runners who are into sustainability, into the earth, into saving the earth, not going in the right, wrong direction, not uh, doing stuff that harms and so forth. Is that basically the? Right. Um, well, it's changed. It's changed um, in its development. At first, it was a group of runners. It was a group of elite runners that were going to live together, um, cut down on their consumption, um, raise awareness on environmental issues, while at the same time competing at national and international level distance races. Mm -hmm. That was what it initially was. Um, but it's actually grown into now uh, a more broad term, which is the Mancus Project is fundamentally a running club that values sustainability. You could be on the Mancus Project if you'd like. Mm -hmm. You could be a member. Um, anybody that wants to be a part of the running club. Um, in the Durango Mancus area, things that we're going to be doing is holding weekly fun runs. We're going to have a race series. We're going to have people that come out to our property um, and work on our organic farm. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that we're going to be doing on property. Um, and teach, teach people in the community about uh, how to grow their own food and, and uh, you know, how to cut down on their consumption, how to manage water use. Right. Simple community-based type solutions. And you don't even have to be in the Mancus area to be doing that in today's day and world age, excuse me, um, via Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. You know, even if you're in Pennsylvania, you can follow us. You can mm -hmm. follow our video series that we're going to have. Um, so now you have the Mancus Project, which is, which is a running club that values sustainability. And then you also have Team Earth Elite, mm -hmm. which is the elite running team, mm -hmm. um, which now we have seven members of. So Team Earth Elite uh, are the individuals that are going to be racing at the front of some of these international and national races, hopefully. So they'll be racing and involved in the running, but at the same time drawing attention to environmental issues, sustainability issues, yeah. living what do you call that uh, when you live a more sustainable life? Is there, are there? Yeah, I just like to it? call it, I like to keep it broad. I feel like there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, stereotypes, I think, with some of this, you know, going green, you know, what's this like, you know, is this a bunch of hippies moving out into the woods, you know? That's what, my, my first know? thought when I heard about the project, and it sound it reminded me of those times, uh, but there's something a little bit different. To there this, is, right? and that's, I'm glad you brought that up, and we were concerned about that as well. Um, 
you know, back to your original question, you know, what is it in general? I think it's just being conscious. Mm -hmm. I think it's individuals from all walks of life being conscious on issues that are important in our day and age. And I thought that the way, the way for change is for people to become educated and aware. Let them draw their own conclusions mm -hmm. and that's when you have change. Everybody loves sports. Everybody loves an underdog. Tie those two together. Here we are, a bunch of kids from all over the country going out with no, no uh, you know, big time connections. We're doing it on our own. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I was talking to uh, Professor Wirtz, who's here at Edinburgh, and he said, you know, that kind of has a rocky feel to it. And uh, it kind of does, mm -hmm. you know. And so when I think about that, uh, it's, it has the underdog and it has the sports, and we're going to try to raise awareness and educate people. Mm -hmm. Let them draw their own conclusions. So is there a vision for the Mencas project that eventually there might be uh, things like uh, environmental workshops or uh, other things going on that are educational that you're bringing people through regularly to? Yes, absolutely. We've got a bunch of ideas, including uh, guest speakers. We're going to have people who are... Um, you know, real experts in their field, you know, of sustainability, um, you know, because we're not experts. We're trying to learn. Um, I'm a health and physical education major, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to work on an organic garden, um, and I'm going to learn as much as I can. So we're going to bring in experts um, to, to give uh, workshops. Uh, we do also have a few of our members are, do have backgrounds in uh, sustainability um, and environmental, uh, environmental education. Um, so we do have some experts, but I'm not an expert, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't claim to be that. But I think that is uh, almost relatable for... But you've got the motivation, and you've got the, the motivation. drive to That's see right. this through. Yeah. I, I think there's a certain bit of urgency, too, to the you know, going sustainable, uh, getting more protective of the earth, making sure that we're not doing as much damage or polluting or whatnot. Now, there's... there. Are, there's controversy surrounding that, right? Yeah, I mean, there, this, These are issues that uh, attract quite a bit of fight. Sure. Well, that's something that we're uh, we're aware of. That that uh, a lot of these issues are, you know, hot button issues. I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. And here, um, you know, here's a bunch of kids, you know, going up into the mountains and training, and we're going to be careful, uh, you know, how we word things and how we say things, um, you know. First off, we're all college educated. Mm -hmm. We all have at least our bachelor's degrees. Um, and so that gives us a little credibility. Um, but there is a sense of urgency, like you mentioned. But I think that urgency can actually work in our benefit. I think that a lot of companies, for example, running shoe companies or any other corporate businesses, have been wanting to go green for the last few years. Oh, yeah. They're trying to do something, um, you know, but they don't know exactly what model to follow. Mm -hmm. In the running world, we'd like to be the model. Right. We'd like to be the experiment. We'd like companies to say, hey, I want to give these, these guys a shot. And what we're going to do is challenge companies, for example, running companies, let's say a shoe company um, that wants to sponsor us. And we're going to say, that's great, that's exciting, but we want you to try to do something different as well. We want to challenge you. So some ideas are biodegradable uh, soles, recycled, recycled rubber on the running shoes. How about use more post-consumer material on your, on your, on your shoe fabric? Um, your apparel, why not have a whole post-consumer apparel line? And it gets even bigger than that. Why not have, we have races every year, marathons and road races where you have all these bibs and numbers and paper registration. Why not do all of that online? Right. Why not have those races where everyone comes together and there's a big bin where you can recycle your running shoes? And there is, there's momentum going right now for these types of ideas, for people to take them and run with them. And I think companies are looking for ways to become sustainable and green. And Absolutely. A very good friend of mine uh, is CEO of a company called E2E that they've taken, they, originally they started out with a soy-based uh, type of uh, resin that hooked bamboo together into a very, very hard material that you can make furniture with. They started out making skateboards with and so forth, but it's entirely biodegradable, wow. and now they're going into all kinds of office furniture and cabinetry and yeah. whatnot. That's so, great. Uh, but there's momentum for your there ideas. Is. 
And so I am not surprised that, well, actually, excuse me, I am surprised that there are not 50 other running clubs trying to do the same thing. And I look around, and, and, and as far as I know, and someone can do the research on this, I don't know that there's a running club that's, that's doing this similar type of model. Um, and so we're going to be the first to the door. We're going to give it a shot. Well, I think that um, something that really ties it together, well, I don't think most people would normally think of running sustainability. You know, they, they would seem like two different areas. But a while ago, you talked about consciousness. And it seems to me that there is uh, a kind of Earth consciousness. And here we just got past Earth Day and everything. And a lot of people were talking about Earth consciousness, hippies and others. Right. And uh, that Earth consciousness seems to go very well with running. Like you were saying, the whole idea of getting out there and you're in direct contact with Earth and with reality and with, you know, some people talk about this moment, you know, the uh, the present, the now, and, and so forth, and I think runners are really up on that. Yeah, and that's a great point. Um, that's a great point because I was thinking that, you know, this is great that I have all these ideas, you know, and, and maybe I'm going to try to do this project, but is anyone going to take me seriously? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned runners already kind of having this uh, interaction with the natural world. Mm -hmm. And I can ask any runner, even jogger, I said, where would you rather run? Would you want to rather run a bunch of loops on a parking lot? Or would you rather run some nice soft dirt trail through the woods? Mm -hmm. And if they run a little bit, they say, well, I'd like to check that trail out. That'd be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Well, there has to be land to have a trail. There has to be a forest to be able to have that experience. Right. If you just put parking lots and pavement over everything, you're not able to have that. Um, so I think in runners, especially competitive runners or people that are racing a little bit even, they run the 5K or, you know, on the uh, a local race or they do a 10K or something like that, uh, triathlon, for example, they're already kind of in tune with their own bodies. They're, they're, they're watching what they eat. You know, they're s deciding, um, I should probably get a lot of sleep before my race. You know, um, I'm going to do some training. So they're, they're actually already having this uh, dialogue or consciousness within themselves um, to accomplish the goal at, at hand, which is, which is finishing a race. Mm -hmm. So I think when you're talking about going back to the basics or going more natural with what you're doing and you're living, I think mm -hmm. it's an easier sell to runners or endurance-based athletes at first because right. they're already having some of these kind of conversations in their mind already. It's just tying the two together. Oh, yeah. And that seems like something that a lot of people have that thought at some point in their life. Like you said, you were in a class at Edinburgh and or classes and you started thinking, man, what are we doing to this earth? We've yeah. got to do something. And I think other people have those thoughts. Sure. And we might get riled for a few minutes or, or a while even, but then uh, it just seems to fade or mix right in with, you know, yeah, making it through the day or whatever. Absolutely. That's another great point. Uh, I thought about that as well. I say, you know, maybe I'm just fired up now, you know. But over a couple of years, I was, I was still thinking about this. I still mm -hmm. wanted to try. I wanted to give it a shot. And then when I thought about, you know, doing this project five, ten years down the road, for example, when I have a job, maybe, and I've got, uh, you know, some more resources and money to be able to do some of these things, I thought about that kind of enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you're getting at. You have this enthusiasm or passion for something when you first hear about it, mm -hmm. and then after a while, it kind of phases out. Well, I think one of the huge benefits that we have with this project is we're all young. Mm -hmm. We're all 23, 24, 25 years old in that age range. And this project is fueled with tremendous passion and enthusiasm. Right. And so to wait 10, 20 years to do something like this, it's almost too late. Right. Do, do it, it now, now while, you while you have the enthusiasm, yeah. while you have the passion. Uh -huh. And then maybe we, 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 our job, when I say we, the members that are a part of it now, uh, we're part of it for five years, six years, ten years, and then we move on. You know, we're gonna. This is uh, in the works of being a uh, nonprofit organization. This summer, we're going to be a nonprofit organization. Well, as you know, with any organization, it changes hands, mm -hmm. and so hopefully, we'll have always new, young people—not even necessarily young people, but people that have enthusiasm—taking over, taking the reins, mm -hmm. and keeping it going. Right. And right now, it's just. Uh, 
I have to get it going. Almost like the, what is that, the field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. Right. You know, right. so we're trying to build it. And apparently there are some people who are coming already, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah we actually have nine members right now, uh -huh. um, including myself. Seven of them are uh, uh, runners, athletes, that are going to be competing for Team Earth Elite. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm going to go right down through and, and list some of them, if that's okay. Sure, um, go ahead. I mentioned Dylan, uh, Dylan Kleinberg, uh, who is our environmental coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, and she graduated from the University of Redlands in Southern California. Um, she has spent time on organic farms. She spent time um, studying different things in Southern California with, with regards to agriculture. So she has some experience. Mm -hmm. um, and she has experience um, in different types of climate than some other people do. Um, so Dylan Kleinberg, environmental coordinator. Um, we also have another member by the name of Dustin Stein. Dustin Stein is our farm manager. Uh, Dustin uh, used to be a competitive, competitive cyclist. Mm -hmm. uh, used to race mountain bikes. He was actually on a Tour de France farm team in France for a while. Um, he's not going to be competing for us as a runner, but what he's bringing to the table is he has extensive experience in organic farming. Mm -hmm. He's been farming and is today, right now as we speak, hi Dustin if you're out there, mm -hmm. uh, in the Mancus area. So here's someone with local knowledge, experience, um, in exactly the challenging climate which we're going to be right. living and growing in, which is at 7,000 feet of elevation by the way. That is kind of challenging. Yeah. It's not easy to grow, is no, it? No, it's not. So Dustin is super important for this project. He's somebody that knows what's going on and uh, knows how to be productive and successful at that, mm -hmm. that elevation. Mm -hmm. So we've got Dylan, we've got Dustin. Um, we have uh, another gentleman who's our vice president uh, by the name of John Yatsko. John Yatsko is uh, just about to graduate from Northern Arizona University, which is in Flagstaff. Um, and John's uh, an engineer. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to be helping us uh, with our building projects, um, using his knowledge to make sure that we're uh, building things that are, you know, more eco-friendly and cutting down on our energy and our consumption. And he's, he has the skills to be able to make that happen. And he also has the skills to be able to talk between the contractors or us um, and how to actually put these things together. Um, and John is also a 1,500-meter uh, uh, specialist as well as the 3,000-meter steeplechase. Mm -hmm. So John's our vice president. Um, also, we have... Um, uh, a Pennsylvania, a couple Pennsylvania connections here. Uh, Christy Foster graduated from uh, Mercyhurst University, mm -hmm. just up the road in Erie. Uh, she is currently in Colorado now, about to graduate. Uh, she's studying uh, sports medicine and physical therapy. Mm -hmm. So she's going to be able to use her skills to help us out with what we're doing. And she's a, um, a great runner in herself. She's run, uh, she was an All-American in college. She uh, has run a marathon in 254, um, and she recently just got fourth at the Colorado uh, 10 mile championships. Uh, so we're really excited to have Christy on board. Um, Christy's husband is named Kenny Foster, also went to Mercyhurst University, and Kenny's a U.S. Army captain, mm -hmm. and also has been a professional runner for uh, the last two, three years. So Kenny not only is bringing his leadership qualities, he's been a U.S. Army captain, um, but he is bringing his experience based off of running all of these national and international races all throughout the country. Mm -hmm. Actually, Kenny was um, just 20 seconds off from making the U.S. Olympic trials Man. this year around yeah. in, in the marathon. So we're, we're really thrilled to have Kenny. Um, other people that are on that project, we have um, a couple of Allegheny College people that are on. Uh, Tony Dupree was a 1,500-meter specialist from Allegheny College. He uh, was an All-American in Allegheny, um, and he uh, is bringing his running prowess as well, but also he has um, a background in neuroscience. So he's a super intelligent guy. We, we're excited to see what he brings to the project. Um, Tony's teammate is uh, Chris Marker. Um, Chris Marker also went to Allegheny. He was a 5,000-meter specialist. And he has an environmental science background from Allegheny College. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so you, you have all these people from all different walks of life. Um, the common thread that bonds us is, uh, you know, we care about the environment. We're young. You know, we're filled, we have all this tremendous passion. And we're going to try to just bottle that up and try to make something happen. This is like a continuation of the Buckminster Fuller type of idea of go, you know, I, I guess you guys won't be building your geodesic dome in the woods or whatnot, but going out, building something, making something, living a sustainable life, living off the land. Right, yeah, we're, that's what we're trying to do. And we also have a coach as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not coaching the team. I'm, I'm going to be, um, my job's our president and founder. Um, and we're, we're, we are going out, you know, building and, and living off the land and stuff, but we also are trying to compete at a very high level, and that's mm -hmm. why I wanted to bring up the coach. Um, his name's Terry Stanley. Uh, Terry's from Pennsylvania as well, another right. Pennsylvania connection. He's run a, a 11, I think, sub-220 marathons. Mm -hmm. so, so, yes, we're, we're living off the land. We're, um, you know, kind of creating this eco-village, and... Uh, but at the same time, we are we are trying to make the Olympic trials in 2016. Right. And Terry, our coach, Coach Stanley, yeah. is going to try to help us get there. And what's the idea? Like, how do you sustain yourself so far as making a living and everything? Are you trying to get sponsors? Is that the, the secret to making this thing run, that sponsors are going to help? That's a good question. Um, we have um, uh, a variety of ideas as far as resources that are going to be able to help us operate. Um, the first being uh, is our organic gardening. We're going to be growing our own food, um, which cuts down on our costs mm -hmm. um, in the long run, see? Cuts down on our costs. Um, we're eating healthier, so we're going to have good food. Um, and we're going to be able to sell some produce. So there's, there's an opportunity for um, some financial revenue. Mm -hmm. um, there will be some sponsorships. We're talking to a few shoe companies right now about sponsoring our Team Earth Elite especially. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're going to be able to provide us uh, with some quality gear and some shoes and such to be able to train at a high level. Um, but we also have other ways to um, support ourselves. And that is, um, one, we're going to be holding some uh, educational camps and clinics. Mm -hmm. um, I know Edinburgh University here has a running camp, which I attended when I was a youngster coming out of high school. And it was a great experience. I got to come to Edinburgh University and live and, and, and run beside these you know, great college runners that I look up to. And uh, you know, we're going to hold a running camp as well. And it sounds like that'd be a great area to go train in, wouldn't it? I mean, Absolutely. Is it, it's mountains. It's uh, nice trails. Is it, it is. So you're at 7,000 feet. Um, and I keep mentioning that. But uh, elevation is, uh, is a huge advantage for distance runners. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so, so youngsters that weren't looking for a high level uh, training camp at altitude can look at the Mancus Projects website and, we're, and, and uh, next summer we're gonna, also, we're gonna offer a high school camp. Um, what else, some other things that we're gonna be what's, doing. What's in Mancus right now? What's Mancus right now is a small town. It's mm -hmm. a small community. Um, there are, uh, you know, there's a main street, uh, there's, a, there's a high school, uh, post office, a um, few local businesses. There are a few massage places. There's um, some restaurants that have uh, uh, some locally grown produce that they're already working with. Mm -hmm. um, it's got that small hometown atmosphere, and I really like that coming from rural Pennsylvania. You know, spending some time here in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. and uh, but right next door to it is Durango, which is a city mm -hmm. about 20 minutes away, and uh, it uh, has about 18, 19,000 people. So there's also opportunities there uh, that are nearby. So we're going to try to put Mancus on the map. We're going to try to make it an international training destination as well. When you mentioned that's going to be a great area for the mountains and the woods and mm -hmm. elevation, well, we're not just going to have high schoolers coming out for cross-country camp, but we're going to have we're going to set up an international training camp, mm -hmm. international training facility, I should say. For example, when I spent some time in Flagstaff there were athletes from uh, Finland, um, there were Olympic athletes from Mexico, there were Olympic athletes from all over the place coming to Flagstaff, mm -hmm. renting some uh, rundown motel, eating at a greasy restaurant, and they were Olympic hopefuls for their country. Mm -hmm. You know, if that's where they're going is Flagstaff at 7,000 feet, 
I think that we could challenge that model. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is one of the projects we're going to be doing is we're going to be building um, six or eight rooms that people can rent out and do training stints. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have this, uh, we're going to have the Team Earth Elite runners living on site training. We're going to have the local community running club that's happening. And then we're going to have the transient running population mm -hmm. from all over the world, hopefully, staying there training for a week, two weeks, a month, you know, right. sharpening and focused for their... on like the whole being, right? Like eating healthy, right. running healthy, the mind, the mind-body yeah. connection. It'll be a total experience, and we'll learn from them as well. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Olympic hopefuls from other countries coming, you know, doing a short training stint. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they sure they sure know about running them, you know, and so we're going to pick their brains. And they can get a great experience because rather than eat at the greasy restaurant down the road in Flagstaff, for example, um, how about eat a salad fresh from our garden? Mm -hmm. You know, how about eat some food that we ourselves grew? Um, making that connection, having that environmental consciousness. Hopefully it starts in the running community and then transcends through endurance sports of all types and then hopefully to mainstream. Now what is it, you know, Ben, a lot of times people have ideas like this and they even might start to work on them and start, might start talking to people, but what's the difference? I mean, this is something that you've taken from ground zero and you've actually started to make it happen. It is happening. You've got the property, you've got the people, you're starting to uh, talk structures and mm -hmm. different aspects of it. What is it that makes you take this further than most people would take ideas? Is, yeah. it, is it luck? Is it motivation? Is it well, another great question. You're, you've mm -hmm. got great questions all night. Um, I think that uh, there's a quote as far as luck goes, that lucky people uh, make their luck. Mm -hmm. Okay, what does that mean? Um, I don't think that anybody wakes up and there's a, you know, a job opportunity that's sitting in front of them or, uh, you know, the classic win the lottery. Sure, there are some people that, you know, get that experience, but for most of us, we wake up in the morning, we have to decide we're going to put on our jacket, we're going to put on our shoes, we're going to go out the door. We're going to go to class, you're going to go to work, we're going to do these things. These are all choices that we make. And so I'm a firm believer that lucky people make their luck and that uh, what you get out of your life is what you put into it. Now, I learned that. I didn't always think that. Um, you asked me as a uh, freshman in high school, I wouldn't know what you're talking about. It was way over my head, you know. But through running, I learned that the more I put into it, the better results I got. Mm -hmm. It just didn't happen. The less you train or less that you put into it, the worse that you run. And so I think running is a great um, sport to learn that lesson that you choose your destiny in, in some form. And so when I first got asked to come on the show, I was, I was thinking, you know, meaning and motivation, how does that tie in, you know? And I thought, meaning and motivation, okay. Well, I think that meaning comes from uh, people that have the consciousness to think that they actually can control their destiny in some form. Mm -hmm. And that's scary because that's responsibility. You know, if I go to school every day and I, oh, you know, class is boring and this and that, you know, that's my professor or, you know, this is school or the weather's bad or all these kind of things. There's all these, you can go through all these things and tell yourself, make excuses mm -hmm. and not take responsibility. Or you can take responsibility and say, you know what, I went to school here. I chose to be here. I chose these classes. I chose this major. Right. And so for me, it was like when, when stepping out into this project, it was... I looked at all the possible jobs that I could do. You know, I could teach, and that would be a great that would be a great career. And I still may do that. Um, I could coach, you know, with my with my athletic background. But each of those things, I felt like I could I wanted to do a little bit more with, and I couldn't find anything out there that met my goals and expectations and the responsibility that I felt that I had to uphold by being an environmentally conscious individual. And so I created something new. And it's risky. And, and it's something that, you know, you're going off the beaten path to do something like this. And yeah. it, uh, it's gutsy. And it takes, <laughs> you know, a little bit of courage, I think. I mean, when you, when you talk about 
you know, creating your reality and that you are this, this awareness you have that you're kind of the captain of your soul, that you are making your life, uh, creating it. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. But then to do something that's totally outside of the norms, you know, the typical jobs, the typical flows, career paths or whatever, and to make something like this happen, I mean, there's got to be something extra, I think, yeah. pushing you, pulling you, making you do that, whatever. Maybe that gets in the realm of meaning, too, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I think that, uh, I think that there's a lot to be learned from new experiences. Mm -hmm. Actually, I know that because I've had several new experiences. Coming to Edinburgh, running, that was a new experience. Kid from rural Pennsylvania, sure, I was good in high school, but can I hack it at the college level? And based off that experience, I gained some confidence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and someone else who was a big believer in experience is um, Henry David Thoreau mm -hmm. and his book Walden, which I read um, a couple years ago and also helped shape my beliefs. And, Wal and, and Henry, he would go, Thoreau would go out into the woods around Boston, Concord, and uh, would just walk out into the woods and observe for hours. Mm -hmm. No real clear agenda, just being. No certain preset scientific data or a set of morals that he was judging himself, just go out and just be in nature. Mm -hmm. And the thoughts that he was able to achieve from those type of experience, experiences are still shaping education in our thoughts today. Sure. You know, I think a lot of our great scholars and people that we look up to in history did just that. Sure, they could have done something that, you know, a typical profession, but they, they chose another, another route. And I think those new experiences were where most of the learning comes from. And I didn't study philosophy, but I've done some reading. And, you know, in existentialism, they talk about, uh, you know, a person um, that great things and new thoughts come from the individual. And meaning comes from an individual. And the only person that can find, you know, uh, for you to find meaning, you have to find meaning in your own way. Mm -hmm. You actually have to go out and experience something for yourself mm -hmm. and find meaning. And so I think in any, in any facet of life, trying something new and just experiencing it, just being there, is going to yield huge Oh, yeah. Dividends. And like you said, maybe now's the time to do that. Now, now's the time when you have this passion, when you're young, when you're so flexible and whatnot. And I think there probably is a tendency as we go through life to get more into a groove, more into routines, more sure. into our habitual patterns and so forth. So yeah. why not do that new experience now? But right. I wonder if you know such new experiences wouldn't benefit everyone. And I wonder if that's, you know, that's a secret that certain people bump into. I might have to see what you're up to in the next couple of years. I might sign you on to the project here because <laughs> I think I'd you're love absolutely, to visit. I'd absolutely love to visit right. out there. Yeah. yeah. In fact, one of my favorite vacations ever. My wife set it up for us, but we just had a baby, so she couldn't go. So I went with my two older kids uh -huh. out to that area and oh, went okay. to Mesa Verde and oh, Four yeah. Corners and all the different, you know. It's beautiful. Yeah. You know? And so can everyone benefit from a new experience? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think it's crucial in everything that we do. Even if you have a solid job that you're that you're working in, you know, and you've put, you know, for example, in education, you know, you've you've got several years, you know, you're tenured, you've you've got a family, you've got things going on. Well, even to take a weekend off, do something different. Mm -hmm. I think that can just take the long way home, kind of. Thing. Yeah, even mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. And for me, you know, I'm such a, I'm at this beginning end of the spectrum, and uh, I've been fortunate enough to have this consciousness that those new type of experiences can yield huge dividends as far as, you know, what you learn and stuff. And so I'm going to make it, you know, make it a point to constantly have new experiences. And maybe that's the benefit of Thoreau's sauntering and everything is that it kind of freed his thoughts, randomized his thoughts to a certain extent. You know, they go from here to there to there and all, all of a sudden you're, you're away from today's worries, the concerns, the anxieties yeah. and so forth. And maybe running's something that can do that for people. Yeah, I think, I think nature, and this is, you know, back again to throw, I think that nature uh, lets us take a break. Mm -hmm. Let's us just relax for a second. You know, you, if you're in a busy city, the freeway's running by, cars are zipping by, 
you're waiting, you're trying to cross the street, you're in this crosswalk, you know, and the lights are flashing, there's all these stimuluses going on. You might be thinking about bills that you have to pay or uh, all these other stresses that are in your life. There's a thousand things going on. You don't have time to think about you or what you're doing or what's my purpose here on earth or what's the point, all those big questions. You don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think some companies or corporations might like that you don't have time for that because it just keeps you shuffling along. But I think when you go into nature, things slow down a little bit. Mm -hmm. You realize that maybe a tree's been there for 50, 100 years. It's seen a lot more than you have. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Now that's a, for another show to start talking about whether <laughs> trees have consciousness or yeah, right, what sure. they've seen. Yeah. Right. But I think the fact that this time is on a, such an, a longer, uh, is, is, is such a longer time, or time is such a longer period um, in nature than it is in our human-centered world. Well, isn't it something, too, I think that many people are interested in, what's the secret to making time stretch out? What's the, you know, so often it seems like the years zip by, and this year itself zips by, and, oh, yeah. and how do you make a life stretch out before you? And I, it seems to me sometimes, you know, I've read certain things, certain authors talking about uh, an infinity present in a moment. And it seems like being in places like nature, running in nature, are opportunities for that infinity to be yeah. in a moment. I agree with that. I think that that's great, infinity in a moment. I like mm -hmm. that. Um, I do something, uh, Dylan, my girlfriend knows this, I tell her, uh, I do some, th some odd things sometimes. Uh, I go out in the woods and if there's a tree that's cut down, sometimes I'll, I'll walk up and I'll just stand on top of the old stump. and. Uh, I'll look around for a second, I'll just be quiet by myself, and I'll look around, and at first, it's, it's hard to be quiet for a little while. Mm -hmm. After a minute, two minutes, three minutes, you know, I start looking around, and I can see the trees, and they're just kind of swaying ever so slightly, and the next thing you know, I start swaying, mm -hmm. and, and in essence, you get that affinity in a moment. Mm -hmm. For a second, or even a split second, you feel that, you know, the trees have been there for so long, or longer than that, that mountain, like or that Like a part land. of everything, like you're all of a sudden, you're part, are of, part of the infinite. Yeah. yeah, and I think that in our daily lives, we're so disconnected. Mm -hmm. So many outside stimuluses that we've created, that we've completely lost touch with, mm -hmm. with that. And that seems like the kind of thing that John Kabat-Zinn and others with uh, you know mindfulness meditation and other visualization techniques are trying to get at, that kind sure. of emptying or being with or being in that moment and yeah. swaying with the trees. And, yeah. yeah, you know, and, then, and that's kind of a, 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 a big example, but I think that even just the average per person going for a hike, spending mm -hmm. some time walking through the woods, I think it can really do a lot for someone. And in the same vein, I think that in sports, in running, when you're at that high level, you have the stress to perform, you know, to compete, to make the Olympic trials or something, Getting back to the basics, getting back to more of the natural world, spending time in, uh, in that area that we're talking about, the Mancus area, for example. Mm -hmm. um, doing trail runs, um, getting back to the basics, I think and I predict that that will yield not only um, a better uh, presence or consciousness mentally, but that will actually compete better. Mm -hmm. We'll be more relaxed. We'll have this more meditative state of mind after living and training in this type of experience mm -hmm. or this type of environment. And so that's really what I'm trying to get at. I don't know exactly how to tie it all together, but I'm trying to create an environment that is more natural than what we have today and bring in a lot of young, educated um, people with huge amount of passion just see where it goes. And it sounds like you're getting truly back to nature. Yeah. I mean, so many people, I mean, so many advertisers, marketers are offering us sure. back to nature, sure. you know, through their product. Sure. And yeah. uh, which, you know, uh, different products more or less. Yeah. But, uh, you know, this kind of consciousness and, and being one and in tune and so forth sounds like a true back to nature kind of movement. Yeah. And, and it doesn't have to be this, um, you know, crazy idea from left field. If we look at actual um, distance runners around the world who are the mm -hmm. most successful distance runners. Mm -hmm. First thing that comes to mind is Kenyans. Kenyans are 
renown in their distance running abilities. And you look at some of the Kenyans' training. You know, you say, well, what, what type of training environment do they have? They beat us in all the races. They beat us on the marathons or the distance races. So what are they doing that we're not doing here in the United States? Well, first thing, they have training camps, about 50 people. Okay? They are getting their food from uh, uh, an agrarian, agrarian society that just literally their families are growing a few plots um, with some food. And they're growing some fruits and vegetables. They may have a, you know, a calf or a cow or something. Um, they're not living like that because they want to. They don't have the money. The average, average Kenyan, my, the last research that I've read, average Kenyan makes around $1,500, 1500 U.S. dollars a year. So, you know, they're living like that because they don't have the other choice. They don't have the option. The United States, even the lowest class, you know, is making probably more of that and can get but, their food but and resources. that kind of minimalist lifestyle, it turns out, is probably ideal for them. It is them. ideal. They're eating healthier. Um, they're spending more time outdoors. Um, another thing we look at is motivation, which ties right into this show again. Why are the Kenyans so motivated? Why do they train at such ridiculous levels compared to U.S. runners? Well, with that same stat, uh, around $1,500 U.S. dollars average, and uh, that's not very much. You want, if I'm a young Kenyan and I'm trying to support my family, um, I can go to Europe, race in the Golden League, which is a track series. I can win a B-class race even like a third tier even race, and maybe I win $15,000 prize money. Or maybe I go to the Boston Marathon and I win $150,000. Mm -hmm. Now to United States, $150,000, well, you know, that's nice, but that's not a ton of money. There's guys in the Major League Baseball that are sitting on the bench that are already starting out with a couple mil, right? Mm -hmm. But to the Kenyan, he's a millionaire. Or, or another motivation is the idea that uh, U.S. universities and colleges will recruit these athletes based on their athletic prowess. And now this typical Kenyan gets to have an education from a great university and um, you know, gets to better his life and, and, and better his family's life. So that's motivation. Here in the United States, it's hard to find that motivation mm -hmm. because if I don't do anything... For example, let's if I, if I just say, I'm about to graduate, right, in a couple weeks here. Um, let's say I don't want to do anything. I just say, you know what, no more school, no more running. I'm just going to literally sit around for a little while. What's the worst that's going to happen to me? Well, there's governmental programs that will probably help me out. I'm probably going to be able to find some food somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be living. My family's okay. You know, things will be all right. So where's the motivation to go out every day and, and train hard? So the Mancus Project and this whole idea, getting back to the basics, getting back to nature, reconnecting with that style of living, mm -hmm. I think hopefully can yield some of those same results. Right. And not just, you know, the different healthy lifestyle and the consciousness, but finding your meaning and motivation. Finding your meaning motivation. It's perfect. Yeah. That's exactly right. I'll tell you what, Ben, this is all great stuff and I hope that this project, you find tremendous success with it and I hope it just grows and grows and we find that you're finding all kinds of different purposes that your group can fulfill sure. to inspire people and uh, make these ideas grow and make us more sustainable. Oh, uh, right, is there anything that you want to tell the viewing audience about the Mancus Project or where they can go for more information? No. Yeah, I would. Um, First thing is, uh, the best way to learn more information on this project is simply go to our website. Mm -hmm. um, and that's www.themancusproject.org. Mm -hmm. You can follow our project members. You can get up-to-date information on you know, uh, what we're doing. Uh, we're going to be launching in September. So after September, you can get video information of what we're doing. Um, also, you can Facebook and Twitter us. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Just search the Mancus Project, and uh, that'll lead you to the right spot. Great. Yeah. Well, good luck with this. It's Thank really you very much. It's been a pleasure. Here. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. Thank great. you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Thank guys. you.